I think it's one of the saddest things when you can look at a public institution like education and see that it sort of breaks down the people it's meant to serve, right? So you can ask me, right? How many times have I walked into a classroom with more than 30 kids? You know, how many times have I walked into a room with not enough books for everybody? How many times have I been told that, you know, sports are going to get cut, an entire engineering program just completely dismantled? You know, and it's, it's nice to just throw those things around, but then it's your friends that drop out, your friends that get locked up, you know, people that, you know, don't make their 20s. And when you really think about it, that's just stemming from public education failing those kids. It's, it's, it's just really sad. But the thing is, the same thing you get told over and over again, the money's not there. You just don't have the funding. But that stuff seems to flow real easy the other direction when you see shit like this. You know what I'm saying? The charter schools, it's real quick. We get these seats, we get this building. Then you have kids that can't even play sports, you know, or do a carpentry class. So it's, it's real sad when you see this stuff. It's really disgusting. And it's all these white men doing business. You know what I'm saying? It's the same story every time. And coming from a place like New Bedford, you look up at that stuff and it's really hard to just feel like school is even worth anything. What's, what's the point of all this? So, I mean, that's something that I can tell you, you know, standing here, but that's a story you hear from hundreds and hundreds of kids. You know what I'm saying? People are going to have to articulate it in different ways. You know, it might seem like that kid's being disobedient or he's an issue in school, but really all it is is resistance to a system that's failing. Yeah, so, Good evening. My name is Leila Rosa. I'm a proud resident of New Bedford and also a parent of uh, two children that go to New Bedford High School. Um, I'm here tonight to speak a little bit about uh, the use of funding, particularly the new uh, Student Opportunity Act that we are getting, the, those funds. And um, I want to speak to the school committee in terms of the need for participatory budgeting. budgeting. We feel very strongly, and also as a parent of this committee, that um, the committee must be involved in terms of deciding what services New Bedford needs. At the end of the day, we are the ones who are impacted by the, the, the way our schools are being run. Um, we feel very strongly that um, we do not want to be a physical presence in the meetings, meaning that we are there so the administrators and uh, the, the, the people who make the decisions at the end of the day just say, yes, the, commun the community was there. We want to have a voice. We want to be heard. Um, we would like for the, the budget decisions to be conditional on a cycle of meetings. We want educators involved. We want students involved. We want parents involved. We want members of the community involved. We feel that the district should fund the top identified items or programs. Um, we want the guarantee of the inclusion of low income parents, low income families. Um, they, they are highly impacted by the way the schools are being run. Uh, we are an immigrant community, so we feel that the voices of those that are immigrant and have their children in special programs also need to be in the room. Um, we feel that um, N NB NBC OS should be in the room. They have been um, helping the community in terms of the demands that the community has, and they have been highly visible, and therefore they should be in the community. We feel strongly as a parent of New Bedford Public Schools that classroom size should be smaller. Good working conditions for teachers results in good learning environments for students. Those We need to think about having smaller classroom sizes. We need to think about the facilities themselves in, or, in, in terms of how those facilities are offering the, the appropriate space for our students. We need to continue to work very hard in terms of special education and emergent bilingual students. I am a professional in um, education and I have been working in education for the past 20 plus years. I feel very strongly that um, the programs need to serve the community because at the end of the day, those students belong to the community. So all the services that are in the school need to be appropriate. Um, we, we feel that whenever we, we need to have um, groups of people who can offer um, 
counseling, trauma counseling. We need to think about the number of nurses that we have. We need to think about social workers, wraparound services. We need to think about after school program because we know that what happens in schools goes well beyond the school walls and we need to make sure that those services that schools can also cross the walls of the school to serve the students. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rosa. Good evening. My name is Sandra Lobo. I am a community activist leader and a graduate of New Bedford High School in 2004. I would like to see the rehiring of librarians and opening of libraries at all age, I mean, all grade levels. Because it is not only a great way to engage students, critical thinking, and digital, digital li, li, um, literacy. Our 21st century skills, our students need to be able to conduct research and identify credible sources of information. Our students deserve access to quality literature. Librarians do far more than stock bookshelves. They expand minds, enable students to think for themselves. Also, regarding after-school programs, let's have more of them. And, and, don't be, um, and I don't mean programs geared towards test prep. Programs that teach life skills. The students don't get to learn during um, regular school hours and be helpful such as budgeting, cooking, um, entrepreneurship and much more what do st students say about that and what do they need start there it's not all about testing on paper because we test ourselves every day by living our lives <clears throat> less testing and more um experiential learning lastly and perhaps more importantly is hiring a more diverse educator workforce we have so many di um different ethnicities in our melting pot of New Bedford. Yet so many of our educators are white. We want more youth to feel more comfortable and proud to come to school and not be ashamed because they don't see a person like themselves teaching. And one, one final thing, we must expand our early education in pre-K. Too many parents can, can't afford daycare and literacy needs to be um, nurtured at young age. This is our children's foundation for success. Thank you. Good evening, anyone, everyone. My name is Liliana Perez Mendes. I'm a student here at Roosevelt, and I'm here tonight to share the opinions of my peers and myself on how the district should spend Chapter 70 funds. You see, we have complex schools and lim limited school supplies, but there's many more conditions that aren't being seen by the general population. It's seen by a very small group of people. People with disabilities, people with things challenging them in everyday, day-to-day -day lives. Students go to school with so many things on their minds, so many things impacting how they go through the day, what their thinking process is. Some kids can't go through the school like that because they have so much that they have to deal with that they don't get the work done. There's so many things going on outside of school that make them feel unsafe or unwanted. It needs to be seen and it needs something to be done. Mental health counselors, people who can come in and relate to the students, people who can hear the students out. So many teachers see that when a student is just sitting there not doing anything, they say that the student is being defiant. But by labeling that as defiancy, you're setting the student back more than you're trying to bring them forward. So you're hurting them more than you're trying to help them. We need people those students can turn to, people who can sit through a class or have a room in the school, that these students can bring their work, find the help that they need, and get the school work done so that they can keep progressing forwards. The more that we hold them back, the less students are actually going, the less students that we have actually going through high school and college, getting the education that we're all trying to give them, but we're going about it all wrong. Instead of doing it by tests or by paper, we need to find a way that the students feel comfortable actually doing it. Another thing that we need to bring into consideration is what happens after school, after college. Most kids don't even know how to get through college because we don't teach it. We're focusing on history and on things that most students don't even use after that. We need to stop preparing them for what's actually going to happen when they're out of that classroom. Because the students and the people that they built that trust in in that classroom 
most likely don't move on with them. We need to teach them how college works. We need to teach them what paths to take, how to avoid being held back after that. Even if we can get them to the next grade level, what happens after that, they're not prepared for. We need to teach them how to make decisions on their own and think for themselves and be able to speak up. Thanks for having me out. All right. Hi, I'm Fabio Diaz. I'm a junior and a resident in New Bedford High School. Um, one of the things that is most critical to us at the high school is to have the have teachers that we can create an emotional connection with. Unfortunately, we feel that our teachers are very under pressure and having to prepare students for standardized tests. Expectations for our students have almost become mechanical instead of teaching us how to be a better part of our community and creating a positive impact that could someday change the world. A huge reason why the connection with teachers is difficult is because our class sizes are too big. AP classes should not be the only classes where the class size is small. We want quality guidance counselors and we want more of them. I know many people who had a great deal of problems with the college application process or scholarship process because they didn't have enough support. We want money spent for better food in our school. We want bathrooms at all times so it doesn't feel like a scavenger hunt when we have to find bathrooms. Many of my friends and I talk about how our school resembles a prison. We don't want money spent on security cameras, fortress-like doors, and administrators forcing our teachers to patrol the hallways as if they're wardens. Police vehicles shouldn't be visible to students as they walk into school. In short, we don't want money for the purpose of creating a prison-like environment. The goal with this money should be to create a positive presence on students and give them a way to escape and socialize with friends and teachers that genuinely care about them. Ever since I was young, I've taken on a role with my friends of being the comical friend that you could always talk to. It's crazy to think that I, someone who isn't even qualified to, to be a therapist, are hearing stories from people who obviously need someone to lean on, but not able to get that reassurance from someone who is qualified and sincerely cares. We desire culturally relevant education. We want African American history, black studies, K Verdean languages, LGBTQ plus studies and history and labor history, where we not only learn about famous businessmen, but also the working class citizens who are behind the genius. Thank you. Those, are, those two students were incredible. It will be hard. I will look at my notes and it will be hard to top that. Good evening. I sit before you as a new Bedford educator for over 27 consecutive years. I'm also a proud whaler, class of 1984, and I still live in New Bedford currently. I have experienced corporate education reform firsthand, standardized curriculum, scripted lessons, high stakes testing regime, corporate educational leadership models, and serious attacks on teachers resulting in premature retirements, exits to other districts, and abandonment of the profession. All of this is disheartening and problematic for a number of reasons. Standardized curricula crafted by third party vendors who are not professional educators, but all too often venture philanthropists, have stripped teachers of their autonomy and have attempted to reduce them to technicians. There are brilliant teachers here in New Bedford who continue to exercise authority over their labor and work wonders with their students. Teachers need to be treated like the professionals that they are. Any use of Chapter 70 funds that does not treat teachers this way should be avoided. High stakes standardized tests like the MCAS have effectively worked to make schools and urban students look bad and low test scores have been used to justify the privatization of our schools. The system has paved the way for more charters and vouchers, draining our public schools financially while pilfering away many incredible students. These tests have little to no educational value. If these tests are built on a bell curve, it means that the so-called achievement gap is not designed to ever be closed. 
Using additional money to close achievement gaps is very problematic. We should be using it to close opportunity gaps and improving the entire learning experience here in New Bedford. Mainstream narratives now include that public school teachers are incompetent, parents are lazy, students are entitled, unions are greedy bullies, and that leadership should be hierarchical and that things should simply be imposed. Much of this happens because this profession is largely fueled by women. Make no mistake, it's an attack on women, particularly at the elementary level. It's also an attack on the communities that are living in poverty and are working class. I say that only to say that many living in poverty actually work. This community deserves the same as any elite community in Massachusetts. As an educator who takes pride in being a public servant, I implore you not to spend the Chapter 70 funds on test prep, additional accountability systems, curriculum from third party vendors, personalized learning, ed tech programs. We don't want our students behind screens. We want them interacting with one another and real teachers. Management such as top level administrators. Instead, use this money to support teachers and students so that they don't have to rely on crowdsourcing platforms to fund classroom supplies and participate in field trips. The teacher to student ratio has to be reasonable considering the challenges our learners face shared by our brave students that are members of our coalition who spoke before me. We will not only attract highly effective teachers, we will keep the ones we have. Then our students' needs will truly be met. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jose Soled, and I am the co-chair of the New. Be I'm a co-chair of the New Bedford Coalition to Save Our Schools, and I've also been an educator for many, many years, from Puerto Rico to the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth at the Labor Education Center, and I wholeheartedly agree with all the previous speakers and what they've said I needed to be done. I want to let you know that the New Bedford Coalition to Save Our Schools has been a part of this attempt and the struggle to get more money for these schools. We were part of MAJOR, the Massachusetts Education Justice Alliance, who fought for this along with unions, community activists, students, parents, and all kinds of different organizations to get more money to make our public schools better, more efficient, and to serve the main thing that they have to serve is the communities. And I'm here to reemphasize that that we do not want this money spent on anything but with, with stuff that will serve our schools and will make our students even more better and feel more welcome in the schools. Already has been mentioned, the ethnic studies is a good example. Uh, we need, but I also do work with the immigrant community. And I work with the community that's trying to get licenses for, for, for undocumented workers. And I have the opportunity when I meet with them to talk about what they face in the schools. And it's disheartening to hear that because there's not enough people in these schools that speak their languages. Many of these, these in, undocumented immigrants need that kind of help. They have no, no clue of what their rights are in these schools. One of the women that I was dealing with last week with told me about an 18 year old son who was told in his school because he didn't speak the language, that he was 18 and he had to leave because he wasn't gonna pass anyway. This is not the way that we should be dealing with these, these people. She didn't know that she had the right not to oppose that because he could go back to school till he got, you know, till the age limit that they have by law, right? Others had a daughter that was sent here, that started school here, no investigation of what level she had done in her home country, which was Guatemala. And she was automatically, because of her age, nothing else, put into the second grade where she cannot deal because she did not have first grade in the first place. She went to like a pre-kinder kind of stuff in Guatemala, but nobody tried to understand what the different systems were. This has to stop. We have to have people in the schools that can deal with these folks, whether they're from Latin America, Cape Bird, Portugal, or whatever, they have to be able to deal with these folks. The money has to go to 
provide these kind of services and the services that our colleagues and co-members of the coalition have said are needed, we will fight till the last minute to make sure that that money is spent on that and not spent on more administrators and not spent on anything else but the students. And the other thing that I want to emphasize before I stop is that I want you to understand, you saw this young lady, students have to be treated like human beings and understood that they have rights and that they can speak up and they know what's going on. You have to give them a voice, just like you have to give the community a voice and you have to make sure that the New Bedford Coalition for, to Save Our Schools is part of this whole process. And we're here fighting for one thing, to make our schools better for everyone. Thank you very much. I just want to echo all the voices that came up first. And the, the first thing I would say is that uh, there needs to be a priority in centering how we gather information. Uh, this process in terms of community input uh, was not truly uh, the most effective way to get input. If we had a restaurant and we wanted to know uh, what food was uh, the best food or what, what conditions we could improve upon, uh, you would go to the people that eat the food first. And the survey that was put out by the school district up until the last week didn't include an option to, for students to even um, be at one of the uh, boxes you could check. Uh, additionally, there's 17 areas where the funding could go, and the questions were open-ended questions um, that uh, were not able to be uh, aggregated and, and pulled the data from in time for this meeting or where this presentation is happening. So uh, what I'm saying is that it's important that the community is educated about the process before they can put input in uh, to understand exactly the, the areas of funding or where the funding can go. Um, and then also that we prioritize reaching out to the students. If we can give standardized tests to the students and MCAS to them, then we can give a survey to them and have them fill out that survey and also educate them about the process of what this funding can go for. Um, things like uh, the school food, this, this is an issue that often we're hearing about, about young people in our schools not having enough food and being hungry. Uh, the, the food for kindergarten being the same amount of food for the high school students at a different age. Um, the, social, the social needs of, of folks in our community, the a level of trauma that we're experiencing between uh, immigrant communities and the attack on immigrants in our country and in our community through ICE to uh, young people from our community that went through our district that have been murdered by police in our community and that impact to violence in our community that's impacting people. These are serious uh, traumas that young people are having and you can't learn about ABCs and algebra when you're dealing with trauma. So these are issues that are intersecting and impacting young people on, on various levels. And I think it's more important that we get more input from young people and we target that input because the, the small voices that you heard today are just the tip of the iceberg. And the, 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 the reach that has happened so far is very uh, small percentage of our population. And it should be the students that are centered in this, this conversation and also the teachers. Uh, the survey also, uh, it, shouldn't, it should be allowed to be anonymous so that teachers don't feel that if they're transparent and honest about concerns that they have, that there could be an impact that comes back to them in the workplace. Um, so I think that these are things that the school committee really looks needs to look at in terms of how you gather information and how you're taking that information, especially if it's open-ended questions. How do you how do you quantify what the community is saying? Otherwise, it's just uh, a survey for the sake of a survey. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So we'll uh, turn now.